Well, this week we continue our series called FBC Branson United, and not because we want to become a soccer club, but because soccer clubs seem to place a greater value on the terminology of united than oftentimes churches do. And so we're in this series to talk about that we need to be united as a congregation, united as a people, and not just a lowercase u united, but a capital U, uppercase kind of united as a congregation, because that becomes a challenge as the church grows, as we have more than one service, as we have three services and two different styles and different people leading and all these things going on. It is so very difficult to be united. In fact, I was asked recently by a newcomer to our church, and he said, hey, pastor, why are you preaching so much about united? Is that because there's disunity in the church? Is that because people aren't getting along and you're kind of telling people what they ought to be doing? I said, no, 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 absolutely the opposite of that. We are probably the most united congregation I have ever seen or heard of, but what we want to do is we want to teach theology before the crisis. We don't want to just be reacting to things that happen in people's lives. We want to be ahead of the game and teaching so that when things happen, we know how we're supposed to act. Now, there is a coincidentally, we are remodeling the kitchen, and so there's some color choices and a few things like that. So I, it just happens to coincide with that. But being united is so much more, and it is difficult because oftentimes churches unite over silly things, and they divide over silly things. Sometimes people unite over the style of worship or what we're doing in this particular room at a time, or sometimes we join because of the color, and we like the auditorium color, and we like all those kind of things, rather than being united in the thing that matters most. And so I've been trying to think about ways that I could illustrate for you what does it mean to be united. And so something kind of popped in my mind this week, and that is the idea of puzzles. Now, I don't know how many of you are jigsaw puzzle fans and you like to put together a jigsaw puzzle. How many of you like jigsaw puzzles? I'm not talking about on your app. I'm talking about like a real <laughs> jigsaw puzzle, like paper or wood. Some of you like that. And I am not a puzzle person. I don't understand puzzles. Why would you buy a perfectly good picture, cut it up into lots of little pieces, put it in a box, and spend two days putting it back together. I don't understand that. May the Lord bless you for what you enjoy. There's a lot worse things to enjoy in this life than putting together puzzles. I am just not very good at it. In fact, when puzzles get to be about more than 12 pieces, they become frustrating to me. And so my mother-in-law for Christmas bought me a puzzle. Now, I don't know why she bought me a puzzle. I don't know why it is, but I know it's mine because it, it has my name on it. It says Neil right there. And for the first few years, it was just that guy. So we made some progress in that, I think, because this says Neil from my mother-in-law. And this happens to be kind of a fancy puzzle. Now, you probably know this, but the largest puzzle commercially available is 33,600 pieces. All right? That is 18 and a half feet long, five feet tall. And these are for people who have a lot of time, all right? This is what they have. They think they're going to live forever with these kind of people with that puzzle. In fact, you order the puzzle, and the puzzle box comes with wheels so that you can move it around much easier. Well, fortunately, this one doesn't have 33,600 pieces, but it has a whole lot of pieces. But what makes this puzzle very unique is it's my town puzzle. And, and here's what you do. Apparently, there's a catalog someplace because that's where most everything happens, the catalog in her world. And you go under this catalog and you put in your address, and apparently she knows where we live. And so you put in the address and they build a puzzle with your home being in the center of the puzzle. In fact, it's got a little home piece on it, and then the, you've got a special number. Here's my little number here that's only, it's a handwritten in there, so somebody wrote that in there. And this puzzle shows me my house in the center of that, and it's got all the surrounding neighborhoods of it, and it's kind of like in that green and white topographical type map that you sometimes have see. It's got the elevations and all that kind of stuff. And so because I love puzzles so much, I was really, really smart. And what I did is starting in late Jan early January, when small group would meet at my house, I put the table out I put the, the puzzle on the table, the ping pong table, so that the small group would have time and energy to put together the puzzle. And so every week they would gather together, and they, while they're eating and while we're chatting and while we're getting our drinks and everything, they would come by and they would build this puzzle for me so that I didn't have to build the puzzle because I don't like puzzles because why do you take a perfectly good picture and chop it up into little pieces and spend the rest of your life putting it together? And so we spent a lot of time on this. In fact, I, I would occasionally during the week grab some of the, the pieces of that and put it together. And so I brought it today here to show you and to show my mother-in-law on the screen that, she, that I, we did this puzzle and we put it together. And so I've got this puzzle. I don't know which camera we're going to go back. Let me go back to the light 
We're going to go to the front camera, and so we're going to try to go there. You know, look, the puzzle's down here, guys. Here's the puzzle right here. Okay, there you go. So we're going to have the puzzle here, and so you can kind of see, and I don't, I don't want to drop this thing, because that would be... Oh, I got you, didn't I? I got you on that one. Because why in the world would you spend all that time putting a puzzle together, and it is together. It's a puzzle. You can kind of tell. I mean, it's got the... It's got the, the, color, the pieces in there. But why in the world would you spend all of that time putting a puzzle together and not glue it together? <laughs> How many of you glue your puzzles together after you make them? How many of you do that? Anybody? You, you ought to do that because that's a lot of work. And so what we did is I glued this puzzle because even though the puzzle pieces fit together and under normal circumstances, everything is okay, but as soon as you lose that direction, the pieces normally will come back to the way that they were beforehand unless you put glue or Mod Podge or whatever you want to put on there to put that puzzle together because why spend all of that time and not make it permanent? That's exactly what Jesus has done for us. You see, pulling all of us together with all of our different backgrounds, all of our different expectations, all of our different likes, all of the things that make us different, and there are a lot. Why would God put that together unless He wanted it to be permanent? And what God has done for us is that He has sealed us together. But what unites you and what unites me is not glue, but it, what unites us is the blood of Jesus Christ. Because you and I have different preferences, we have different expectations, but what unites us is not ourselves, but it's Christ. And so over the past several weeks, and we'll continue today, we're in the book of Philippians chapter 2. So if you've got your Bibles, join me in Philippians chapter 2 as we experience what this unity is supposed to be like and what it means so that you and I might truly be united. Now, this is our fourth week in the series, which means we're all the way to verse 5. And so we're making huge progress. In fact, we're ahead of where we should be. But we're going to look at verse 5. But let me just remind you that Paul here is writing a letter to a church, and he cries out for them to be united. And he begins to argue and make his case that because you've experienced some things individually as a person with God, his, his encouragement, his love, all those things that are found in the first couple of verses, because you've experienced that me aspect with God, that should drive you to a we aspect of God, a we aspect of God, where because I have Christ living in me, the power of the Holy Spirit in me, because of my repentance and believing and trusting in Him, that I must turn to others who have had that same experience and that we might become united in the soul. And we might be one soul, verse 2 and 3 kind of says that to us. And that's why we gather together. Yes, it would be easier sometimes if we were just by ourselves, we didn't have to deal with anybody else. But we're called to come and gather and be a part of something larger than ourselves with people who are not like ourselves to not only demonstrate what God has done for us, but to teach us some things about ourselves and then to teach something to the world as well. Well, that's all good and, and great until we actually have to start doing something about that. And then last week we talked about how we do something about that is that we begin to think or count others as more valuable, more important than ourselves. In fact, when we come in here, we should be thinking not just about our own needs, and we all have needs, but we should also be thinking about the needs of the people around us. And so that's all good and great until we start doing that, and it gets old very, very quickly. It gets difficult very, very quickly when I'm thinking about somebody else rather than me. So Paul, in verse 5, turns his attention to another motivator, another reminder of why we should do what we do, why we should seek to be united, and it's this. He says, have this mind, this attitude, this direction, this way of thinking, this disposition, really is what the word means, have this disposition, this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. What unites us is not my mind. What unites us is not your mind. It's not your preference. It's not your ideas. It's not your thought. What unites us is that we have been given the capacity to have the same attitude that Christ had. And if I've got the attitude of Christ, I've got the mind of Christ in me, seeking to do what he's asked me to do, seeking to, call, to be called out and to respond to his scriptures and be obedient, and if you have that same mind in you because of the experiences that you've had, then when we come together, It'll be his attitude, his mindset, his disposition that unites us. And Paul here kind of goes into something very interesting. In verse 6, most scholars tell us the beginning in verse 6 is really a hymn, an H-Y-M-N, hymn. And, it's, it, and what they think is that this might have been a song that was popular among the early uh, Jewish Christians. 
And so it seems like Paul then is thinking about these things. He's thinking about having the same mind, and something reminds him, something prompts him of a song. Now, it could be a, it maybe not a, a song song. It could be just kind of a written song, something that was repeated. Maybe it was just a reciting something, or maybe it was a collective reading or something like that. But we think that this is something that he were, was reminded of and picks up and then drops in this place that they probably were familiar with. In fact, they might have hummed along. We don't know. But when we look at these next verses, I want you to think of a couple of things. I want you to recognize, number one, the high Christological view that these early Jewish Christians have. This is just within a few decades of the living of Christ when this is written. And even by that time, they have a high view of who Jesus was. At that moment, they already understand that Jesus was God. This was not some construct that was added 4,000 years ago or 2,000 years ago from, from that time or, or years and years. This was something that happened very, very quickly. And I also want you to, to recognize how that, that song moves, how that, that, those stanzas work. And so I don't have a lot of time this morning, so let me just kind of jump in there and kind of call some things to mind. So this is maybe a song. It was something they, they recognized. It's a hymn of their day. And this is where he kind of quotes that and picks that up and puts it into the text. Who, talking about Jesus, Jesus, the mind of Christ, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now, let me stop right here. You know, I hope, that the Bible did not drop out of the heavens into a bookstore at your local neighborhood in English. I hope you understand that. The Bible originally was written by men who were inspired in a unique way, different than any other inspiration, and those guys wrote originally in Hebrew, some of it was written in Aramaic, and the rest of it was written in Greek. And so, as you know, those of you who have taken a foreign language, you know there has to be translation from one language to another language. In, in addition to that, there is some concepts and constructs and context of an ancient culture that is slightly different than a modern culture. So when you pick up an English translation, you are not reading the original, what we would call the autographs, the original writing of that. And so when you pick up and read something, there have been choices made for you in the English language by scholars based upon their knowledge of the original language. And so sometimes, and that's the reason we have different translations. We have the NIV, the ESV, the King James Version. All those are different translations, different attempts to get the words into a modern context so that you and I could understand them in English. Sometimes those decisions are made very well. Sometimes there's some things that are kind of hidden in that. And some people will look at this verse and study only from the English language and say, ah, Jesus wasn't really God, but he was kind of in the form of God because they don't know their Greek and they haven't studied the things that are behind that. So let me just kind of quickly remind you, because you may or may not know this, but when we talk here about the form of God, that word for form is a very interesting word. In fact, that word for form only appears two times in the New Testament. It appears in verse 6 and it appears in verse 7. And that particular word is the word morphe. And morphe doesn't just mean in the form of, like it's just kind of covered up, but it really means in the essence of. In fact, some of you have translations that say in, was in the very nature God. In fact, that's probably a better translation than this translation of form, though it is accurate, but it may not be as helpful in the context. Let me, let me see if I can push this to you. If you grew up in church or you had a, a grandparent and, and they would take Jell-O, and, and Jell-O was very popular in the 70s and 80s. I don't know if it's as popular anymore. I guess they still make it. I don't know. But one of the popular things to do was to make like a fruit Jell-O kind of salad kind of thing, right? I mean, you know what I'm talking about? It's kind of like fruit salad kind of thing with Jell-O, and you mix it in there, and it might be good, and it all kind of jiggles. And, and then what, whatever it is, <clears throat> you can put that thing in all kinds of different shapes, right? You know, for some reason, the bunt pan was very popular, <laughs> for fruit salads with jello in them. I don't know why that was real popular, but it was really popular. And you put that in there, and then you flip it over, and then you got this bunt pan-shaped jello kind of a thing that was happening. And then, and then maybe your parents weren't that, didn't, didn't love you as much, and they just took like a cake sheet pan, and they put it like that, and it kind of was there, like in a cake pan. And, and so you just had like a cake pan shape, and they put it in like squares. Some of your parents really, really loved you, and they took those little, those little shapes, and they made like, like the jigglers or something like that is what they call Bill Cosby would, would argue about that, and they put in a little shape, all that kind of stuff. All those shapes, it doesn't matter shape of jello, what is still in the pan? It's what? It's jello. 
And, and so that's kind of in the sense that the form here is not talking about the shape of it in. That, that's a word, it's a different word in the Greek, it's the word schema. And the schema means on the outside, not on the inside. And so Paul could have chosen schema if he wanted to, but he doesn't choose schema. He chooses morpha, which really kind of means that the essence, that, that if you can move in jello, whether from a bunt pan or into a square thing or into a dinosaur, whatever shape, it is still jello. That's what this word really is trying to convey. No matter the shape, no matter the form, then the essence, Jesus was God. He didn't become God. He didn't become like God. He wasn't just a, 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 an extension of God. Uh, he, he wasn't any of those things. He was in his very essence, in his very nature. He was God. But here's what's interesting. He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now, this is, this is confusing, and scholars spend all their life trying to unpack these passages, and I don't want to spend all our time. We've got other things to do this morning. But I want you to think about this. It's not that God is going to give up His essence. What He's counting as not equality that He doesn't have to grasp hold to are some things that are beyond His essence, beyond His nature. There are rights, there are privileges, there are responsibilities, there are attributes that are His that he is going to say, that's really not as important. And what he's going to do is, as he goes on, he is going to make himself nothing. He's going to empty himself, the translations better say, he's going to empty himself of some of the attributes, of some of the abilities, some of all of those things, but what he's not going to empty himself of is not his nature. His nature is going to stay the same. He is going to hold on to his nature, his essence. I, I, can't think of good illustrations of this. So I'm watching football and I'm thinking about all those guys who own the teams. They've sold a team in the last couple of weeks or something like that. And sometimes you'll see them and they're showing the crowd from the television camera angle and then they'll show the owner of the team. And you'll see the owner in this big fancy, they call it a box. It's not, it's not really a box, but that's what they call it. This box, and it's usually at the 50-yard line, and there's always food around them, and there's like televisions behind them. And so the best thing that I can think about is this. It's not a good illustration. It's the best I can do. Um, but it's kind of like this. It's like the owner of a team deciding that he's not going to sit in his box for the games, but instead he's going to sit where you and I sit, right? Roads, triple Z, Seat 4,294B, up there, way someplace where you and I sit. And if he moves himself and he doesn't watch the game from his box, is he still the owner? Absolutely he's the owner. But he's not taking the rights and the privileges that the owner has. He instead is emptying himself of those values. Now that's a poor, horrible illustration of what Jesus did. I mean, I'll admit that. But it's kind of like that. It's kind of like that. It's like he gave up the attributes of his nature, the equality, the positional equality, the knowing everything, and he emptied himself of that. He remained God. His essence was the same, and he took up, same word, the form, the essence of a servant. He didn't lose his essence. He didn't give up his godness. He gave up the attributes and the position temporarily, submitting himself to the Father so that he would be able to take on the form, the essence of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. That means this. He knows everything we've experienced. You can't say to me that God doesn't understand me. He doesn't understand the temptation. He doesn't understand how bad it is. He doesn't understand because he's been just like us. He has been like us. He knows exactly what we've experienced. Now think about this. He, he doesn't think that's something to be grabbed hold of. He doesn't grasp and hold on to that, like that's his and nobody else can have it, and it's so important he's not going to lose it. He doesn't do that. In fact, he empties himself of that and then becomes in the image, in the form, in the essence of man. Now, this is a, just a thought that I know is a strange thought, but I started thinking about this. I was reading some commentaries, and this commentator pointed out this fact. He said this. He said, isn't it interesting that the one who created everything ended up having to borrow things on the earth. Now just imagine if you're God and you created everything there is and you come to the earth in the form of man and you have to borrow stuff all the time. You have to ask, hey, can I borrow your boat so they can push that out so that I can preach on there? He could have walked in the water if he wanted to. If the Father would give him a permission, he could have walked in the water, but he has to, hey, can I borrow your boat so I can push out over here? Hey, um, I need to ride into town and, and I don't have a donkey. Could you, can somebody go find me a donkey? He could have made a donkey if he wanted to, right? 
He could have made a fleet of donkeys if he wanted to. I mean, he could have done whatever he wanted to do, and yet because he's limited, just imagine, this is the guy who thought up rain and now has to suffer when it pours down. He didn't even have a house. He borrowed homes when he slept. In fact, he even borrowed a tomb. He wasn't going to use that one for long, which is good news for us. But can you imagine God in His glory when angels are singing about Him, holy, 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 perfect, perfect, perfect. And He can go, yes, 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 because it was true. Now, when people say that about you, it is no, no, no. It's just not true. And you can hire people to sing that around you if you want to, and you can think that that's what everybody is, and that's what, but it's simply not true. But with Jesus, it was true. In fact, their words weren't even true enough. And yet he empties himself of that, becomes a man, takes the very essence, suffers with us to that point. And then being found in a human form, people go, yes, he's suffering the same things. They they didn't talk about him being different. They didn't talk about him when it's time to to sleep at night and you're laying on the hard floor. They don't say that Jesus kind of disappeared for the night and came back. No, he, he was seen as doing all those things. Takes the form of a servant and he humbled himself by becoming obedient. He actually had to do what the Father said. In fact, there were several times he's like, do I have to? Not my will, but your will. Being born in the likeness, becoming obedient to the point of even death, and not just any kind of death, not just a friendly fall asleep at night, wake up in heaven kind of death, but death on a cross. That's what the first stanza sings about this Christ. Talk about a deep theological, Christological view of Jesus within a few decades of his life and death. They got it from the very beginning. May we not lose it. But then, maybe it's... Stanza number four, verse number four. We know it's not stanza number two or verse number two because you never sing verse two, right? You always sing him first, third, and last when you grew up. Therefore, notice the, notice the switch here. It was his humility, but notice what else happens here. Notice what that, what that causes. What's the result of that? Because sometimes we spend our time thinking that Jesus is on the cross. He was on the cross. He's not on the cross anymore. He's at the right hand of the Father, ruling over the universe in the position that he was always designed to be. Because God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. You don't believe in Jesus? That's fine. Your knee will bow at some day. You want to work against Jesus? That's fine. Spend your lifetime doing that. There'll come a time when your knee will bow before him. The apathetic, the agnostic, the antagonist, they shall all bow in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and every tongue, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. See, that's that's what unites us. It's not glue. It's not singing kumbaya. It's not saying, I don't care what color the kitchen is, even though you do. (laughs) It's none of those things. It's the blood of Christ that unites us. And once we're united in that, it will never, ever change. So the question for you today is, have you received that blood that covers your sin? See, some of you are hiding from your sin. In fact, you're covering it up, hoping no one ever finds it. And you're running. And Jesus said, you don't have to run anymore. I know what you did. And all you've got to do is repent because I've already died for that. I poured out my blood so that instead of God pouring out his wrath upon you because of his holiness and your unholiness, instead of him pouring that out on you, I poured it out on my son so that he then can take his righteousness and transfer it to you so that when you die, God won't even remember your sin if you've repented of it. And the remembrance for that for us is this Lord's Supper that we're going to take in a few moments. There's nothing magical that we believe about the the cup and nothing magical about the bread wafer thing, nothing magical, but it is a reminder of what Jesus has done for us to buy us back, even though we've sold ourselves to everything else. If you've never made that decision, you can today and find forgiveness and find a community that will love and encourage and help you. Maybe you've done that before and you've done that a long time ago, but you just need to be reminded again, the sacrifice that Christ made, so that when you have to make a sacrifice and not get your way and not get what you want, that you remember that Jesus did that to the nth degree, far beyond what you were ever able to conceive of. And he did that so that today, any name that will call upon his name today can be saved. And those who don't even do that one day, they will. It'll be too late, but they will. 
because they will recognize what God has done. So as we gather around this table this morning, and as we observe the Lord's Supper, may we do so with a new reminder, a new emphasis of what Christ has done for us, that we who were unholy have become holy and united with each other and united with Him through His blood. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes this morning? Maybe today you've never made that decision. If you never have, then at the end of our services, I'd love for you to come visit with me. I'd love for you to contact me during the week. Find somebody that you trust in the faith, and you say, I don't know what that guy was talking about, but that I want to know more. And maybe today that's going to be a journey, a step on your journey to know him. Or maybe today you've trusted Christ, and you've kind of been apathetic. Your, your holiness has kind of gone down. You've been kind of doing your own thing, and yet today he's called you back to himself. And you're reminded. And maybe in this moment when we observe the Lord's Supper, it'll be just a new and a fresh start for you. Praise be to God for the fresh starts that he gives us. And so, Father, help us in these moments to trust you and to know you and to believe you. Father, we thank you that you have made a way for us, a way that we could not make ourselves, a way back to you how you've brought us and how you're stronger than any of our sin, all of our sin. And that the worst things that we have done are never bad enough as long as we repent, as long as we confess. So, Father, as we approach this table, we do so reminded of what your great sacrifice for us and that we might be sacrificial as well in our lives so that others may come to know you. Help us in these moments to meet you in this place. And we ask these things. In Jesus' name, amen. We believe that the Lord's Supper is a symbolic act of obedience whereby baptized believers through the taking of the bread and the fruit of the vine both remember the death of our Redeemer and we look forward to His soon coming return. If you have trusted Christ as your personal Savior and have been scripturally baptized, then you are welcome at this table.